Welcome to our Thursday night Q&A. Today is week 75, and I have a fun presentation for you tonight that we're going to talk about. The nine ways that I help people grow food, YouTube, weekly Q&A, Patreon, my soil laboratory, and the three-day boot camp, consulting, my book is ready for you to order for a Christmas gift for somebody, and newsletter. All this information can be found at www.georgicrevolution.com. Boot camp's coming up January 11, 12, 13th. Get signed up and come. I've already got people signing up, so we are doing it for sure. It's going to be fun to have winter boot camp, and you can come see how to run a greenhouse in the middle of the winter so you can have fresh vegetables all year round. My summer class is starting in May. So get signed up for that. All the information is on the website. Our presentation tonight is a quick overview of a much larger presentation that I have been giving for some other educational groups. So I just want to go over this real quick. This is going to be maybe a 10-minute version of an hour-long presentation. So there's a lot of environmentalism going on in the world, and whether you lean towards believing it's true or believing it's false, it's irrelevant to the what we're talking about here. We, we work with the earth to create human products. That's what we do. We don't extract from the earth in a way that hurts the earth. We help it. So I'm frustrated when I hear the environmental movement always talking about how humans are destroying the earth. That is the message that our young people have heard all of their lives. And it could be true. It could be false. It, and that argument, I'm not even getting into that argument. What I'm saying is that environmentalism is always about politics. I've never seen when it isn't. And it's never about ecology. I've never seen where it is. And I really want somebody to show me an example when modern environmentalism actually worked. When did it really, really work? The word liber means a liberal arts education. It, it's an ancient word. It's actually a scientific word in plant science. So I like to talk about plant science a lot. But liber are the, the you've got the, the xylem and phloem cells in plants that go up and down, um, mostly in trees is where we use those terms. Well, the liber is part of those cells and it's in the tree bark. So when you make paper, you would often make paper in the early days with tree bark. Um, nowadays, they take entire trees and, and pulp them up to make paper. But in the early days of paper making, it was those liber cells that were made. Now, liber becomes the root word for library, the root word for liberty. So uh, if a person reads a library, they have a liberal arts education. Now, there's so many books published today that we can't read them all in a lifetime because there's too many. But it's still the idea. Let's say you read 500 to 1,000 books. You're going to have an education. If they're fantastic books, then you'll probably have a fantastic education. If they're not very good books, then you probably won't have a very good education. But reading a library creates an educated person who understands how the world works. That's why we call it a liberal arts education, is because it's a well-rounded person who basically can have a conversation with anybody about pretty much anything because we know what people are talking about. So a library education is knowing how to make natural resources from the world that we live in. So we've got things like permaculture, biodynamics, holistic management, and regenerative agriculture. Those are the headlines of the modern way of working with the earth to create food, clothing, water, shelter. How do we have a civilization with the basics? Ways to do that. Now, Georgics, geo meaning earth, orc meaning work, and the, and the word comes from the Roman poet Virgil. And he wrote his Georgic poems, but the literary tradition went back 700 years before him to the Greeks and when Hesiod was writing. But this is where you actually do the work that you understand. So Liber is understanding, Georgics is doing. It's the work aspect of it. So you would be making the natural resources into a product that humans use. 
So we would be creating food, clothing, housing, water. We, we are creating those things. Now, how do you create water? Well, I'm talking about a well or a pipeline so that we don't have to drink out of a, a river. Now, there's nothing wrong with drinking out of a river, although today most modern rivers are somewhat contaminated, so it may not be a good idea. Georgics is the stewardship, meaning we're out there actually looking at the land. We're on the land. We're working with the land. Husbandry, it means very much the same thing. We're out there taking care of plants and animals. Management, the same thing. We're out there working, managing, making sure that this all gets done. So Georgics is the work side. The liberal arts education or the library education is the knowledge side. So when we understand the permaculture, we know that it gives us the best agricultural design. When we understand biodynamics, it gives us the the very best soil tests. The highest soils come from the biodynamic farms. The holistic management, that's where we have learned how to turn degraded land into productive land. And there's people around the world doing that. In the deserts of China, people are growing forests. In the, you know, and, and we can go on and on with those types of examples that are happening. Regenerative agriculture are using these very same principles, except they are creating topsoil in a very large area. Uh, in 2023, which is right now, this summer we reached 38 million acres. So this is not about home gardening. This is about changing the entire earth to become a paradise, to become a Garden of Eden, to stop the deserts from advancing. We turn that around and we start advancing the fantastic results of a green living, water flowing, beautiful place. So the Georgic Liber link actually reveals something. When we have that liberty, that liberal arts education, we have read a library, we understand what work to do, to create ecological literacy. But you can't just go out and work really hard because that's where we are today with extractive agriculture. People are out there working extremely hard to grow a crop, to sell it so they have money for their family. Almost anybody can do that. Any able-bodied person can do that. It's not that hard. There are some things you need to understand and it takes one season of farming to understand that, and you will be a fantastic extractive farmer until the earth decides to not work anymore, and you will be farming in non-functioning soil. And we're seeing that happen in mass in soils that have been farmed for the last 50 years in, in an extractive way. So the Georgic Liber link with that liberal arts education and we receive an ecological literacy. And when people have a, this Georgic Liber link, then they stop doing the negative things. They stop blaming, they stop excusing, they stop complaining, they stop being afraid of things and being fearful. They stop wanting, they stop taking, um, wars stop happening, Fighting stops happening. What do does an ecological literacy person do? If you have ecological literacy, what do you do? Well, you create more life. You don't kill things. Quite often people say, oh, man, I have all these weeds in my garden. So what do you do? You go out there and you kill them. That's the normal thing. I have all these pests. What do you do? You go out and you kill them. That is not correct. An ecological literate person will go out there and they will bring in more life. If you have a, a disaster in your farm, you probably don't have enough life. You probably don't have enough diversity to have a balance so that you are creating what you need. And this is not theory. This is not a good idea. This is not pie in the sky. We have the data. This is actually true. So what did I do about it? I wrote my book, Worry-Free Eating, and this explains how all of this works so that people can actually create more so that they can stop doing the negative things that hurt people. And this book is ready for order on Amazon. So go get it if you don't have it. If you already have it, then you've read it and you already know that it's a pretty darn good book. So buy 10 of these and give them out for Christmas presents for people this year. That would be a fantastic thing to do.
yes, I'm trying to sell my book because this book will change the world if people will do what it says. Because I've done the things in this book and it works. That's why I wrote the book is I was so excited about it. So the question comes up, can this Georgia Gleiber link actually increase the natural resources? Yes, it can. And I'm going to show you some pictures where it has happened. See, if we do the right thing, they become more abundant because of our mindfulness, because of our management. Management creates more. And, you know, what about rain? Can we make it rain? Most people shake their heads and say, nope, you can't control the rain. Yes, we can. And this is the thing that I'm trying to evangelize. Yes, we can. We can make it rain. Humans have been interacting with the environment for thousands of years, either making more rain or making less rain. The ignorant people of the earth have created deserts so it rains less. The educated people of the earth create grasslands and forests, which increases the amount of rain that happens. Okay, here's some pictures to prove what I'm talking about. So Jeff Lawton, he's one, he's probably our top uh, permaculturist in the world today. Uh, you know, he's the great evangelizer of modern permaculture. Bill Mollison was the creator. Uh, Bill Mollison is no longer with us. He's passed away. But so, but this is one of Jeff Lawton's projects. So this is in the Middle East somewhere. I forgot the country. I used to know, but uh, there's this place, and he went in and said, "said Let's take this property, and we will plant it to a food forest." And now this place is uh, a, where people come to learn how to create more. So they've created more life, and they didn't do this in an extractive way. They simply planted climate appropriate species that would grow with the water resources that they have. And now they are producing food. Here's an example of holistic management. The great scientist Alan Savory, this is the same piece of uh, property here in 2004. You can see very much bare ground. In 2014, a decade later, we have abundant grass. The ecological tool that was used to do this was grazing livestock in the proper way. So on the 2014 side, grazing livestock the proper way. 2004 side, not enough livestock, just run, walking around wherever they wanted to be, they will create a desert very quickly. So when the environmental movement says, oh, cattle are bad, absolutely I agree, cattle are bad if they are not managed properly. But if they are managed properly, they will create a lush, wonderful grassland, which makes food in the form of milk and meat for people who live in those areas. And, and so there's people in this area who used to feed their children three months of the year. Now they feed their children 12 months of the year because there's enough feed for the livestock year round. True story. This is in Mexico. This is not the same property. These are neighboring properties, but the picture was taken the same day. So this is Alejandro Carrillo. His ranch is this green one. And the same day, this is the, his neighbors on the other side. And he runs a lot more. His capacity for his dense stock density is, I don't know, probably 10 times more. I don't have an exact number on that, but I'm guessing 10 times more cattle run on his ranch than the neighbor's ranch. And the way that he created more grass was by putting more livestock on here and moving them when the plants told him to move them. And then he wouldn't bring them back to graze until the plants told him to bring them back. But only ecologically literate people know how to read ecology. So you have to learn that skill to be able to know. Uh, this is my friend, Tony Malmberg, Tony and Andrea. They live in Oregon. This is one, this is the ranch. So the right on the property, the left picture with all the green grass coming down to the water's edge is looking onto their ranch. And they are on a bridge. They were standing on a bridge. And they went and walked to the other side of the road and took the picture the other direction on the neighbors. The, the, the road was the property line. So this one where there's a lot of bare dirt, 
coming down to the creek. This is the neighbors. The same landscape, different management, different husbandry. Ecological literacy on the left picture with all the grass. Ecological illiteracy, or at least poor management, on the picture on the right where there is an abundance of, you know, bare, bare ground here. So this would have the same rainfall because it was just across the road. So why is it more grass growing? Because rain doesn't, rain is not the factor. How much rain you get is not the factor on how much grass grows. So we pray for rain and God brings it every time we pray. But the real question is, have we built a barn to put the blessing in when we receive it? I'll say that in a different way. Have we created a functioning soil to hold the water so that the grass can grow? Okay, so let's do a quick review. Soil health community. They have a liberal arts knowledge of to know what to do to make healthy soils. The regenerative agriculture people, they created large areas we're up to 38 million acres, okay? So they created large areas to restore the depleted soils. That's what they have done. A lot of times we hear this whole thing and we think, oh, this is great for the backyard farmer, but how am I going to do that with my 1,000-acre farm? Or, or, or we just excuse the big farmers. There is no more excuse for the big farmers. I feel bad for the people who are still doing it the extractive way because that's expensive, and they're probably not making very much money, and they're probably stressed out. So regenerative agriculture can restore this on large areas. Permaculture, they have the very best agricultural designs. Biodynamics have the very best soil tests. Holistic management, that restores the deserts into grasslands and forests. And we've, we can, there's examples of that on every continent except Antarctica. Silvopasture, it is the best yield of land use. So for per square foot, you're going to get the most calories uh, by using a silver pasture method. Um, Georgix builds the best citizens of our communities. Ecological agriculture, they know and understand clearly the four ecological processes, and we have to understand that. It's extremely important to be able to understand that. And of course, ecological literacy, that is, comes back to the library education. You have to have that library education to become ecologically literate. And profitability in farming is the result of all of these things. We have to have all of these hooked together. So in my Georgic schoolroom, these are the things that we have combined. Now, let me be really clear here on something. You can go to a regenerative agriculture movement. And if somebody says, well, what about permaculture? The regenerative ag people, when I say a movement, I'm talking about like a seminar. You go to an event, okay? So if you're at the regenerative agriculture event, somebody says something about permaculture, the people there say, yeah, I don't really know much about that. There's some people doing some good things with that. Uh, and, and another individual may say, yeah, well, but we're the best, you know? Regenerative is the way to go. Just do it our way. And, and they're kind of prideful about it. You go to a permaculture event and you say biodynamics or any of these, you say, well, what, a, what about silvopasture? You know, biodynamic people, they may say, oh, yeah, there are some other people out there doing some good things. But, you know, biodynamics is the way to go. That's really where we're at. And that's what we want to focus on. Uh, you go to a silver pasture event, and they're going to say, oh, but we're the best. And it's that way with all of these groups of people. If you go to their event, they are going to say that they are the best and the other ones are not as good. And I simply completely 100% disagree with that because this gives us the best of all the worlds. So in my Georgic schoolroom, what I did is I combined – the groups of people who were out there with the very best results, and I have combined them into one classroom, one farm, one graduating certificate that you take home, 
and you can take a permaculture design home and figure out how to incorporate that onto your land. You're going to take the principles of biodynamics and create your own soils, which are going to be the best soils that we've ever tested on the earth. You're going to go home a great citizen because you understand Georgics. You're going to know your four ecological processes, so you're an eco-ag person. You're going to uh, understand library education and how important that is. And if you continue that for a decade, then you will eventually become extremely ecologically literate. It takes time. You can't do that in four months. You're going to have great soil health. You're going to be able to uh, restore any soil in the world. Go buy the worst piece of land that you can possibly find. Probably not the salt phalats in northern Utah, but almost anywhere else on Earth. And you can restore the land. So if you if you get toxified land, it can be done. It takes a long time, decades. But in three to five years with normal land, you can create a, a thriving, growing, beautiful ecosystem. So that is my shortened version of this lecture um, for tonight's q and I just wanted to get it out there so everybody could see this. And so let, I'm going to stop my screen share here. And we're going to open this up for Q&A. So go ahead. And ask your questions if you have any gardening questions tonight. So you can unmute and let's uh, talk about your gardens and how we can help you have the most fantastic garden of your entire life. Hi, it's Melanie. As usual. <laughs> um, okay, so we asked our neighbors for leaves. And one of them called and wanted to know if we wanted a truckload. And we said, yes. And then he added, well, it might have grass in it too because he mows lawns. I don't know what he mows them with, maybe with a big riding mower. And so it's leaves mixed with the lawn. What, what, what is your thought on that? I asked what kind of grass because we certainly don't want orchard grass seeds in our yard. We already have it. Um, so um, give us your thoughts on that. Okay, here's my thought. At this time of year, there's going to be very, very few weeds that are going to seed on lawns. And if he's a landscaper who's mowing lawns, then he has a job mowing lawns. So he's going to be mowing weekly. And so the lawns that he's mowing, he's not going to be out there collecting a bunch of weed seeds. So I really doubt there's any weed seeds that are in that material. OK, if there are if you think there are weed seeds in it, you could look at it really closely and try to figure it out. Just ask the guy, do you think there's weed seeds in here? Because if there are, I want to do a hot compost and compost it. If there's not, then I'll just put it on my garden and he will be honest with you and say, yeah, you better compost it. There were some weeds in, in some of this, uh, but I'm guessing that there are no weeds in it. So you could just put it right on your garden. If there are weeds in it, then make a, a hot compost, a thermophilic compost, so that it gets um, above 131 for three days or 150 for two days or 160 for 24 hours. And then you turn it once it reaches those thresholds. And then anyway, yeah, you just, so those are my thoughts on that. But fantastic. It's the best thing ever to get those weeds. <laughs> I meant to say leaves. <laughs> leaves. Yeah, exactly. And when he said truckload, I didn't know how big a truck he was talking, a pickup truck or one of his great big trucks, who knows. Um, he also said uh, most of his grass is Kentucky bluegrass. And so he'd yeah. just be cutting the tops, throwing it in with the leaves. And so you think that would be okay to put on top of our garden right now? Absolutely. Yeah, fantastic. All right. So I'll say yes, bring it over. Yeah, okay. yeah good, good. So, so what happens to my compost uh, during the uh, cold weather? Yeah. Yeah. Does so, it sit there dormant so if, if you're, are you talking about uh, a thermophilic compost that you're making right now or an old compost that you've already made? Well, it's, it's kind of uh, old, but that's, uh, I mean, I don't know whether I've followed uh, the right principles or not. I've uh, yeah, uh, put, uh, put, uh, uh, green as well as brown and uh, um, in, into it and uh, 
Okay, so so is it a finished compost or is it still hot? It's still, it's still on. Okay, well, just keep turning it until it cools off. Uh, the cold weather won't bother it. It'll cool off naturally when it wants to. And then once it cools off, you just spread it out there on your garden and you're fine. So, so once it cools off, then? Yeah, just, just let it cool off naturally. Because you usually, it, you'll usually turn it five or six times, uh, you know, to uh, until it cools off naturally. It gets below that 131 threshold and it never gets above it again. Once you're at that point, then it's time to use it. And how long does that take? Or, or does that make a difference? I mean, it could happen, happen in a week or what? Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, from start to finish, you can make a compost in 30 to 60 days. Okay. We probably I mean, have the, you know there is the aging process. You leave you can you can use it at that point, and it's uh, it has value as a food for plants. So, but if you want to make it grow a lot of fungus, then you're going to keep it um, aging for you know six months to a year, and you don't want it to freeze at that point. So, if you can put it somewhere where it won't freeze. But I don't know that you have a situation like that. So you would want to, if you want to age it for a long time in your situation, then start a compost in probably March because it'll be going through the hot cycles. But once your hot cycles are done, then it will age until October when you get your frosts and then you'll have a good fungal compost. But so for the one you have right now, um, you're just going to want to, you know, go ahead and use it. Use it this fall, get it spread on your garden plot. Okay. okay. Um, I have a quick question. Um, so I am making a, uh, a soil, um, and I know that you often say not to worry about this particular kind of thing that I'm doing, but I, I want to do it mostly for fun. I want to make a really good true loam with the 40% sand, 40% silt, 20% clay. And to do that, I'm trying to actually like mix up like soils around here and finding a spot that I can get each of these things reliably. Um, and so I've been doing the um, put it in water, spin it around, let it settle to see, you know, what's what. Um, and I have read that it is helpful to put in, and, and forgive me, I've only ever read this word, and I'm not sure how to say it, um, a deflocculating agent um, so that you can, so that the different particles actually separate. Do you know if that's actually necessary to get a good scientific, you know, differentiation of your clay and your silt and your sand? Or do you think that's uh, silly? What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, hold, hold on. What, what exactly is your question again? Um, is a deflocculating agent actually necessary to do the thing where you spin up dirt and get it to settle into its constituent components inside of water so that you can actually tell, like, how much clay, how much sand, how much silt you have in your soil? Well, yeah, I mean, it's 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 nice to know. I mean, I do that all the time. Um, and yeah, what, uh, you know, I mean, you've seen me do that. <laughs> yeah. So, do you have to add a so, so yeah, agent, that's my question. The, so, yeah, I mean, if you use the agent, it can it can be helpful. <sighs> yes, yes. In a soil laboratory, it's helpful. But there's a lot more to it because the soil laboratory is not growing plants to create food. So is it practical for somebody growing food? Not really. Besides, the thing that um, when when you get when you want to flocculate all that clay, so it, meaning you break it up, the thing that does that naturally are the microbes. So if you have a compacted soil, you want to get those clays flocculated so that they're busted up. And so that you can get oxygen down in there and microbes and water and nutrients. The reason for the, or I mean the, the agent you want to do that in mother nature are the, the eight important organism groups. You know, you got to have your bacteria, protozoa, fungus, nematodes, microarthropods, incotraeids, macroarthropods, all, the, all these creatures, earthworms, 
you you want to get those in there in mass so that they are creating the you know a really good soil food web which is what dr elaine calls it but yeah and how do you get them in there you feed them you feed them so what melanie was saying of getting um, some grass clippings that's gonna feed what it's gonna feed the bacteria and she's getting dried up leaves that have fallen off the trees what's that gonna give her fungus fungal food yeah so there's the fungal food and the bacterial food that's fantastic so if you give them food long enough we, and we call that the detritus sphere it's the dead organic matter that's four to six inches deep on the ground level and and that's practical for a small garden area if you're a giant farm you're probably going to have one or two inches um, that you can maintain but either way it will build your uh it'll build your soil so that that creates the flocculation that you want in uh you know in your clays in those heavy clay soils and um when you're dealing with a really really sandy soil like really sandy like you, water just runs straight through it and out the bottom out the other end of the field um how <laughs> how do you deal with that <laughs> it basically so exactly looks like the, the same exactly the same as clay you put on four to six inches of detritosphere on top you start feeding the microbes and you and then they will come and if you you know it can take you eight to ten years to get those microbes in there by feeding them but what you do is you inoculate inoculate just means to introduce so you introduce those microbes you get them in the soil by making a compost you grow the microbes in the compost then you make a compost extract and you just pour that water that compost juice all over the the ground wherever you want those microbes to be and then if you don't know if the microbes are there then get a microscope and take a class come to my class i can teach you in a day how to use a microscope <laughs> So j just to clarify with the sand, so generally when I've, maybe I'm doing this wrong too, when I've been planting in more clayey soils, I've put down my detritus sphere, and then when I'm transplanting or planting by seed, I tend to go under the detritus sphere, dig a hole kind of in the sand and or or the clay and kind of put the plant down in there. Is that right, or should I be planting it in the detritus? What's what's like the best method here? Yeah, so if I don't know, context context is really important here. What you're talking about, I mean, you, what are you are you three years into your garden yet, or was last year your second year? Um, so that was no, yeah, I'm three years in. Uh, I've one plot of my garden. I'm three years in, and one that I'm only two years in. So, so you remember it's three to five years before your soil functions. So don't feel like you're doing it wrong. It takes time to build this up. So, but yeah, I mean, if, if you're finding that your plants are not doing well, everywhere that you put a plant, dig a hole a little deeper and get some potting soil down in there where your plant goes. Like if you have a small garden with only 20 plants, even 50 plants is not that many. You can dig a whole, little hole where you put your transplant in, put in two handfuls of a good compost right there where your plants are going in. So, yes, you're going below your, your rotten straw or hay or leaves, whatever is on the surface, wood chips, whatever's on the surface, go below that line down into your soil. But if you feel like your soil is miserable, put two or three handfuls of a good potting soil mix that you've made yourself that is that is – filled with all the microorganisms and uh, fertilizer mix to get those plants thriving and growing. When I say it takes three to five years to get your soil functioning, that's without adding any fertilizers, pesticides, or herbicides. But it does, but during that time, you have to add plant food. If your plants are suffering and you're thinking, oh, it's okay because we're in the first three to five years. No, that's not okay. 
You fertilize it like mad if you have to. Your plants should be thriving every year. It's just that after the three to five years in your soil functions, you won't have to buy the fertilizer anymore. Here again, in context of the backyard gardener, they may only spend $8 a year on fertilizer. But in a 40,000 acre cornfield, they can spend $500,000 on fertilizer. So context matters. So, so let me give you a little context. <laughs> so I have one part of my garden that I've been working on for three years. This last year, everything did pretty good, and I'm excited to see what next year holds. My other part, I'd only been doing for two years, um, and it's a giant thing that I just put a ton of rotten hay down on, and now it's broken down into soil, which is neat to see. And then I have a new part where I went through and in a grid system, dug a bunch of suck sunken beds where I'm going to be planting some things this year. But I haven't done anything to that soil, and it's just kind of the native uh, half of it's really sandy and the other half in a different area is really, really uh, clay. It's kind of weird. It's like there's a river of sand in this one spot. Um, any, anyway, th my point is that I want to give those plants the best chance they can have. So my thought was take all the clods of dirt that I have from digging these things, mix them up into their constituent parts, add whatever I need to to turn them into a really good loam, inoculate them with bacteria from my hot compost that just finished and then try and like fill the holes back in with that newly inoculated loam. Uh, do you, what do you think about that plan? Is that a good idea? Uh, from what I'm comprehending, you say, yes, it seems like a good idea, but there's always nuances that I don't understand when people talk to me over a phone call or a zoom. So I hope yes. <laughs> cool. I'll do a video call with you later and show you. <laughs> nice. Okay, tonight has been fun. Thank you for being here. Next week is I have one, I have one next question. Week, next week is Thanksgiving. So we will not be on next week, but we will be on the following Thursday. John, you get your last question of the night. All right. Okay. <clears throat> what I want to give is we're, we've dried our, our onions, but you can see there there is a, a little bit of green that almost looks like it's uh, continuing to grow there. Get rid of that portion. Do you eat green onions? Uh, well, you sure. Yeah. Okay. Then get that in the sunlight, in your window, so that it turns green because it is starved to death of light right now. And as soon as that turns green, then you chop it up and throw it in a stir fry. Okay, that portion or the whole thing. Just you the, can eat that entire the, thing. Everything on that is edible. The most nutritious okay. part of that thing you're holding is the dried up skin that you're going to throw away. So that should go in a cheesecloth Put that in a tea bag or a cheesecloth and put it in the soup while you boil the soup and then pull it out and toss it afterwards. All of the nutrition in the dried part will leach into your water and that's the most nutritious part. I didn't know that. All right. Well, thank you. Awesome. You bet. I have a question. Should we put all our leaves and grass on top of our square foot gardens? Because you say every bit of soil should be covered. Yes? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good Thank night. You. Good night. Good Have night. a fantastic Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. I will. I'll be with you. Oh uh, yeah, that'll <laughs> be good. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.